conference, can I now welcome Elaine Smith, MSP, Shadow Cabinet Secretary for the Eradication of Poverty and Inequality to open our debate. Thank you, Elaine. Good morning, conference. It's a privilege to address you here in Dundee as the Shadow Cabinet Secretary for the Eradication of Poverty and the Inequality that underpins it. It's an absolute disgrace that in 21st century Scotland, 20 years on from devolution, poverty, hunger and homelessness are on the rise, while the richest 1% own more wealth than the bottom 50% put together. Over 1 million people in Scotland are living in poverty and 70% of children who live in poverty live in a household where at least one adult is in work. Low wages, precarious employment and zero-hour contracts mean that work doesn't always provide a route out of poverty and when wages are low, parents are often forced to use food banks or rely upon vicious payday loans. Here in Scotland, like the rest of the world, it is women who continue to have the lowest incomes and are concentrated in the lowest paid, least secure forms of work. And many health inequalities are symptoms of poverty. It really is a stark statistic that in the most deprived areas of Scotland, on average, men die 10 years earlier than those in the most affluent areas. And for women, it's seven years earlier. And shockingly, Child poverty in Scotland is also rising. A quarter of Scottish children, that's 260,000 children, are living in poverty, and that's 40,000 more than the previous year. And depressingly, forecasts show this is only set to increase. The SNP conference could have used the new powers over taxation right now to tackle the appalling rise of child poverty in our wealthy country, but they chose not to. With one in four children in Scotland living in poverty and the associated impact on their well-being and future life chances, there is no time to waste in tackling this scourge in our society. The Give Me Five campaign, supported by trade unions, churches and charities, has shown that a £5 top-up to child benefit would immediately lift 30,000 Scottish children out of poverty. We fully support this top-up and only last week Mark Griffin, MSP, moved amendments to the Social Security Bill in the Scottish Parliament to implement this. Disgracefully, they were voted down by an SNP Tory alliance. That £5 could fund a breakfast every day or a winter coat or going on a school trip and that could stop children being hungry, cold and left out of school activities. Conference, we know what can be done when Labour is in power. Right now, in Labour-run local authorities, our councillors are fighting poverty and delivering vital services despite the vicious SNP cuts to their budgets. In my own area, North Lanarkshire, our Labour-run council, Labour council is piloting a scheme this Easter in Coatbridge to provide food 365 days a year for children to tackle holiday hunger. And I also hope that you will join with me in commending all of our Labour councillors for finding innovative ways to tackle poverty. <laughs> Scottish Labour will not stand back while children suffer, people in deprived areas die younger and the rich grow richer while the poor grow poorer. We will poverty-proof all of our policies to ensure that they meet our ambition of reducing poverty and inequality. We will hold the SNP to account for their timidity and their lack of ambition and we will attack the Tories for their austerity agenda and the cruel benefit cuts. The Tory benefit cap is callous, it's a callous policy that has already resulted in families here in Scotland losing their homes and households also struggling to survive. With the devolved powers the benefit cap can be mitigated and that is what Scottish Labour will demand.
Welfare and housing are inextricably linked, with increasing numbers of people being pushed into poverty and homelessness. Scottish Labour believes that a home is a fundamental human right, and we will fight for the right of every citizen to have a warm, dry, affordable home. And we call on the Scottish Government to stop winter evictions right now. The private rented sector is out of control, contributing to an increase in poverty. Housing comrades must be for the people and not for profit. <laughs> Confidence, I believe the people of Scotland are ready for change. The Scottish Parliament set its sights high back in 1999. We promised to build a better society, to pass laws and make policies that really made a difference. Our ambition, Scottish Labour's ambition to tackle and eradicate poverty needs far bolder measures than the SNP are prepared to consider. Leaving wealth and power in the hands of the few will not deliver better lives and justice for the many. So it's time for real change. Confidence, Labour is ready to govern both in Scotland and in the rest of the UK. Our policies are for the many, not the few. contribution there and for all that you do at Holyrood. Thank you. Can I now ask the delegate moving contemporary motion one from Glasgow Pollock CLP to come to the rostrum just down at this side here and the seconder to come forward to the side of the stage. This, this, this side here, please. Conference will have noticed we're sort of the other way around to um, the, w the way the stage is normally set up. So we keep looking one way and people are appearing at the other side if you're, if you're wondering. Thank you, please stand. Thank you. Um, Jess Galloway, Glasgow Pollock CLP. Conference. Last year, more than four and a half thousand people were made bankrupt in Scotland. Of those, almost three and a half applied for their own bankruptcy. These were people who had no other options. They could no longer pay their debts as they were due, and they owed more than they were own, more than they owned. The official channels will have told them that bankruptcy was the only option left for them. They would give them and their family a way out. A fresh start from the incessant phone calls and letters, the persistent harassment from debt collectors that would free them from being prisoners of their unmanageable debt. These, however, comrades, were the lucky ones. These were the people who were able to access a solution. Currently, bankruptcy comes not only at an emotional cost, but also at a financial one. Many of you may not realise that the application fee for access to minimum assets or full administration bankruptcy is £90 or £200 respectively. Stop and think about that for a second, comrades. These are people who have already got more going out than they've got coming in, likely living on under £75 a week in universal credit. I ask you, comrades, how on earth are they meant to be able to afford these additional fees? I'll tell you how. By cutting back on food and other essentials, by going without completely, by borrowing from friends and family, pushing yet more people to breaking point and dividing our com communities yet further, and most farcical of all, comrades, by relying on advisers to write to charities like the British Gas Energy Trust to ask them to pay the fee for them. More appallingly than this, comrades, thousands do nothing. Not for lack of trying, not for lack of advice, not for lack of a will to help themselves. They simply aren't able to find the money. They aren't able to apply for debt relief despite advice that it is the correct thing for them to do. They continue to drown in a sea of debt, their heads held under by the very system that is meant to protect them. It wasn't always like this, comrades. Prior to 2008, when bankruptcy was awarded by a court rather than some accountant in the bankruptcy office, if you were in receipt for means-tested benefit, you were entitled to a fee waiver under Scottish Legal Aid Board rules. It was acknowledged that access to debt relief is a right that should be available to all and no one should be priced out of that. 
Comrades, we oh, thank you, Bron. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, comrades, we are now in a grave situation where debt is on the rise again, currently standing at over two hundred billion pounds. It is higher than it was before the credit crunch. Interest rates are on the rise, inflation is at 3.2%, income levels are stagnating. There is no question that in the coming years, the number of people who will be struggling with unmanageable debt will rise. How we treat the most vulnerable of people reflects on us as a society. Citizens should always be treated with dignity and respect. No one should have to sacrifice a healthy diet, a warm home or the clothes on their back to appease the absurd elaborateness of capitalist system. <laughs> Scottish Government policy should not force these situations on people. The SNP Government and its timidity is putting people's lives at risk. They're not interested in taking any positive action on poverty that does not net them a front page story in the Herald. Thank you. They're treating people's lives like a game, comrades, and at the moment they think they're winning. But we can change that. We can put agency back in the hands of the oppressed and return some humanity to this traumatic situation. I urge this conference, therefore, to vote for this motion condemning the SNP's heartless position and calling for the Scottish Government to adopt the recommendations of the Money Advice Service to reintroduce fee remissions and waivers for those who need to access a debt remedy but cannot afford to do so. I ask you to move this motion. Thank you. Can I ask, is there a seconder or is it being formally seconded from the floor? Oh, seconder. In the meantime, can I ask the delegates moving contemporary motion two and uh, seconder to make their way towards the, the front bit? So, yes. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, conference. Uh, John Cork, Glasgow Pollock CLP. I'll, uh, I'll keep this graciously short and sweet um, because most of the major points are covered by my comrade Jess there. Um, I just simply want to say that I ask you to consider if you were in that sort of financial situation where all other avenues had been closed off to you and bankruptcy was the only out you had, then being asked to stump up 90 or 200 pounds just to declare that you have no money left. Think about how that would, like, how that would make you feel, how you would manage that. And ask yourself, these fee waivers were removed in 2008 by the S&P government. Why was that? Why was that done by them? So it's short and sweet. So uh, I second this motion. I ask you to vote for it. Um, thank you. OK, can I ask the delegate moving contemporary motion two from Asda to come up? Thank you, Chair. Conference, Karen Whitefield, moving this motion on behalf of my trade union, ASDO, about ending child poverty and making work pay. In many ways, I wish I wasn't standing here now. I wish I wasn't moving a motion on child poverty. I wish that none of this was necessary. But it is. And families the length and breadth of Scotland don't need warm wishes, they need action. What they need is positive action to tackle the rise of child poverty in our country. In Scotland, here in the city of Dundee, in some parts of Glasgow, and in my own constituency of Airdrian Shots, there are areas with some of the highest levels of child poverty in the whole of the United Kingdom. Child poverty has grown faster in Scotland um, since 2010 than in any other part of the United Kingdom. None of us can possibly be okay with that fact. And none of us can be okay with the fact that one in four children in Scotland are having to start um, a life hindered by poverty. 
For these children, we know life is a struggle. Their education suffers, and for too many, they do significantly worse than their peers. Not because they lack ability, but because they are more likely to have a stressful home life. Too often, they lack the facilities to do their homework and are simply bullied by um, the stigma of being poor. In addition, their physical and mental health can suffer and children from poorer backgrounds are more likely to suffer from serious or chronic illness during their childhood and more likely to be disabled. And they also have a significantly shorter life expectancy than children from more affluent backgrounds. Traditional roots out of poverty, working hard, doing the right thing, is simply not enough because for too many of the children uh, growing up in poverty today, they live in a home where at least one adult is in work. How can it possibly be acceptable that in a country as wealthy as Scotland, this is happening today? How can it poss be possible that children growing up today in Scotland are likely to be worse off than their parents' and grandparents' generations were. Work needs um, to pay enough to support good quality of life for everyone and their families. As a Labour Party, we cannot rest while poverty increases in our towns and cities. Making child poverty a thing of the past must be a priority for our party. ASDA wants um, uh, to halt the freeze on child benefit and see it rise by £5, a small sum which would have a significant impact on the lives of children across Scotland. We need to work with our brothers and sisters across the UK Labour Party and Labour movement to introduce a statutory real living wage. and to make zero-hour contracts and short-hour contracts a thing of the past. <laughs> Conference, I'm sure it comes as no surprise to any of us that Theresa May talks about those who are just managing and fails to act. She's not alone. The SNP and Nicola Sturgeon say that they too are concerned about families who are just managing. They say they want more powers, but it seems to me that they don't want to use that the powers they already have to take action. <laughs> and it's action that these families need. The Labour Party needs to be a party of action. It's scandalous that when the SNP's government's own figures show that fewer than 2,000 of the estimated 54,000 low-paid households in Scotland are eligible to claim council tax exemption, they don't actually do anything to make sure that those families get those exemptions. And that would make a real difference to thousands of families who are already on the breadline a real difference to their household incomes right now. And there's no extra power required, there's no change of the law necessary, just fewer warm ones and a damn sight more action. Conference, I say that if they won't, we should. We should be out in our communities, talking with people about the help that is available now. Building the foundations of a Labour victory and a Labour government here in Scotland and across the UK. Conference, please support. Thank you, Karen. To ask the seconder to come up now, please. Councillor Frank McNally, Erdingston and Belsill, CLP, seconding the motion. Conference, under Labour, child poverty continually fell. But after eight years of austerity and ten years plus 
of SNP complacency. Child poverty is on the rise. Now, we know what we're getting with the Tories and we should not be surprised. But it's the same now with the SNP. Not a guardian against austerity, this SNP government acts as a vessel for further cuts. Until we have governments willing to take real action to tackle the causes of poverty, we will not make progress. It is a national disgrace conference that 260,000 children in Scotland live in poverty. It is a national disgrace that some children come to school on a Monday morning not having had a proper meal from the previous Friday. It is a national disgrace that I can take a 10 minute walk from the Civic Centre in Motherwell to neighbouring Craig Nuke and life expectancy has fallen by 12 years. Now Labour councils protect vital frontline services and are often the last line of defence in the fight against poverty. But we are doing so with our budgets being decimated. But despite these cuts, our North Lanarkshire Labour budget has outlined important steps for tackling the scourge of child poverty. We are expanding breakfast clubs to every primary school and for the first time it will be free for, for children eligible for free school meals, giving children the best possible start to the day, assisting low-income families and supporting working parents and guardians uh, from incurring expensive childcare costs. Our footwear and clothing grant has been increased by close to 60%, from £70 to £110, one of the highest grants in the country, because no child should be made to suffer because of their uniform and no family should be pushed further into poverty or debt just to clothe their children for school. And these follow our ambitious announcement recently for a Food365 scheme, which would see low -income, uh, children from low-income families fed every single day of the year. Con conference children ready to learn, ready to contribute, ready to make their mark on the world. Now, Conference, these are steps being taken by Labour councils against a backdrop of cuts. Imagine what could be achieved with a fair funding settlement and real partnership working. Imagine what could be achieved if we had a government at Westminster and in Holyrood that took tackling poverty seriously. Our young people deserve better. Low-income families deserve better. They need Labour governments that will fight for them. Conference, support the motion. I see a show of hands of people who are interested in speaking this, in this, this debate. That's good. We've got quite a few. I'm going to take three at, at a time. So um, if I indicate you for the first group of three, if you could make your way forward. Siobhan, here and here. Thank you. If you come across to this side just now. In the meantime, can I, um, for, the, for the benefit of new delegates, um, what we do at this point is we, we take the vote on motions at the end of each session. So the motions that we are going to be discussing this morning will take the vote on these before we break up for lunch. And also to remind you that we do have a traffic light system here at the rostrum that you will see when, when you're speaking. Um, when you see the amber light, that's coming towards the end of your allotted time. And remember speaking from the four, four minutes maximum. When the red light comes on, that's to say you're at your maximum time. Once it starts flashing, remember the trap door. Okay? So, our first speaker here, thank you. Conference, Siobhan McCready, uh, United Union. When I started working as a community worker many years ago now, I would never have believed I'd be referring people to a food bank. And when I say referring people to a food bank, I'm talking about every single week, every single Friday afternoon, spending hours of my time referring people all across my community to food banks. That's appalling, absolutely appalling situation to be in. These are men, women, young, young people, particularly young men, young men struggling with mental health, young men isolated, young men abandoned by their families. It is absolutely brutal out there. Their, our neighbours, our friends, and sometimes even our colleagues, some of my work colleagues, professionals, are now, are now looking to, to get support in food banks. We are in an absolutely appalling situation. There's so much in work poverty out there. It's not other people 
that are affected by this. It's our people who are affected by it, and that's what people need to see. This is our people, our, our communities, our friends, our families, our neighbours, all affected by this. Public sector workers are at absolute coalface. We see this, this real poverty on a daily basis, and it's grown. We see pe people sanctioned for the absolutely slightest thing. We see people with learning issues, disabilities, disproportionately affected by this. We see young men, young, young women with their children, some tiny children with nothing, absolutely nothing. You have people who haven't ate for days and they're, they're desperate. It's, it's absolutely brutal. Public sector workers need support. We need money put into the public, public se sector and we need support to be able to tackle this because we are the best people to be able to do this. As a Unite activist, myself and a couple of colleagues are in the room today, we got together and we decided we were going to try and do something in our area because we just couldn't stand it anymore. So for the past few years, we've been going out there every single week out into the community, raising money through our, through our activists, our members, going out there and trying to address some of the needs. But we're, we're only scratching the surface, but we are addressing the need out there. But this year, we, we were knocking doors on Christmas Eve to give parcels to families who didn't have a thing in their house for their children. Not a thing. They had no food, they had no toys, they had nothing at all. It is utterly horrendous. So, Poverty in this, this level is just absolutely unacceptable in a rich country like ours. We need action urgently. So let's work together to ch champion this. Let's look together to move this forward. We all need to work together to change this for our, our families and our friends out there. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Matt Kerr, uh, Communication Workers Union, and, and I should uh, probably uh, say as well, a member of Glasgow Pollock, so very proudly uh, backing uh, Jess uh, on her first time conference speech on, on that as well, so I think she's done very, very well indeed. It's also my first conference speech after all these years, uh, which is a bit of a strange one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thought it, eh? Um, and I believe the trap door is designed just for me. I'm the reason they've got the traffic light system for speaking in Glasgow City Chambers. I was at the queue, was just around me, reminding me there, so I'll try and behave. Yesterday uh, in Govan, we were down at the uh, unveiling of the Mary Barber statue, and I know this is going to feature later in conference, and rightly so. She was an inspirational figure, but what was she fighting for? She was, fight she was a, a work working class person. She didn't even have the right to vote, and she was fighting for working people, fellow working people, to get some stability back into their lives. What is the, the, the feature of our age? It isn't just the fact that people don't have money in their pockets, it's the lack of stability. They don't know when they're working next. They don't know if they're going to have a, a roof over their heads the next week. These are the challenges we have to face as well as actually putting money into people's pockets. And it shouldn't be discretionary. We're relying, people in, people in our, our communities, up and down the land, are relying on charity. Good people doing good stuff so they can feed their families, in spite of the fact they're going to work. Since when did work, work not pay? That's what we're supposed to be all about, isn't it? Even the Tories claim to be about that. But apparently it doesn't anymore, and they're content with that. Well, I'm not, and neither should the Labour Party. We, we should be moving away from a discretionary system. You know, we looked uh, what we did in, in Governor. I, I want to pay tribute as well to a comrade of mine, uh, John Beattie, who organised the uh, Govan Toy Bank at Christmas. And again, another excellent example of, a, of communities coming together to put, uh, to put toys uh, uh, in, in people's homes and, and, and uh, give people a, a sense of Christmas in, in, in communities and in fam with families who have next to nothing. It shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't have to rely on luck, on charity, to make sure people have a decent start in life. It's not acceptable. And the Labour Party's main function is to make sure that none of these things are discretionary, but an absolute God-given right. You have a right to work. You have a right to a roof over your head. And you, have, you should have the right to be able to pursue your dreams in education without being encumbered with debt and without being priced out of it, as people are today. When, when the SNP talk about 
scrapping tuition fees. They don't talk about the massive debts our students are, are building up because they can't afford to live. And that is where we, sh we must divert some resources into. If we are going to rebuild our economy, that's where it begins. So we put stability back in people's lives. We put money back in people's pockets by rebuilding the public sector. That means paying people a proper wage rise. At the last budget meeting in, the, in Glasgow City Council, people were saying, from the SNP, were standing up and saying, we're going to give public sector workers the 3% pay rise they deserve. Does anybody in here think public sector workers deserve 3%? No. They deserve what they're asking for, and that's the 6% they, that they ask for. And I'll be honest with you, I think that's, I think that's the least they deserve. After 10 years of cuts to their wages, to be told, to be told that they're going to be gifted 0.2% below inflation yet again is not an increase at all, and it's an insult. And I hope and, it's, and I will support trade unions in asking for much, much better, because they can do better. And we, pro we proved that with our, our draft budget that was put forward to the Scottish, was laid before the Scottish Parliament. There is an alternative here. If we had a government in Scotland which actually decided to prioritise the needs of working people and prioritise the needs of the public services that support them, then they can do something about it. They can genuinely challenge austerity. They can genuinely challenge the Tories, but they choose not to. They're timid. They're scared. Are we scared? No. We stand, we are the party. We are the party of Bevan. We are the party of the man who wrote in place of fear. We built a welfare system and a public, a public service, a national health service to take fear out of people's lives, to give them stability, to give them hope, to give them a chance to bring up their families in peace and security and bring the economy and all the communities with it. That nobody rises without bringing their community with them. That's what the Labour Party is for and I proudly support the motions here today. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Conference, Kieran O'Neill representing the Scottish Cooperative Party, first time delegate and speaker. <laughs> Conference, I'm really proud to stand here today as a socialist and as a cooperator. The Cooperative Party believes that things work best when ordinary working people have a say and have a voice, and when services are accountable to the people who use them. We want to see democratic and public ownership of the services and utilities that all citizens rely on. We want to tackle the housing crisis that we're facing through cooperative housing and alternative models. We want to make sure that fans have a say in how their sport clubs are run, and we want to make sure that we can use credit unions as an alternative to rip off payday loan lenders. That conference is the cooperative way. Yesterday, I had the honour of holding the cooperative party banner in Govan as the Remember Mary Barber Association unveiled the statue to that inspirational socialist and cooperator who led the rent strikes in Glasgow and went on to become one of our city's first female councillors, a Glasgow Labour and Cooperative councillor. And even now, <laughs> even now in the city chambers, even though we're in opposition, proud Labour and Cooperative women like Maggie McTernan and Eva Murray are living on and fighting for her legacy. Mary Barber fought for a while, fought for a better world. And well, thanks to her struggle and the struggle of other women like her, things have improved. We still have a long way to go. It's not acceptable that in 2018, over one million Scots are living in poverty and that a quarter of children and young people in one of the richest countries in the world are going to bed hungry. The scourge of poverty in Scotland has been accelerated by the Tories who don't care and by the SNP who just don't want to do anything. The SNP government had an opportunity last week in the Scottish Parliament to make a difference. They had the opportunity to support Labour's amendment to the Social Security Bill and deliver a £5 top-up on child benefit. Instead, the so-called progressive nationalists didn't just sit in their hands and abstained, they voted with the Conservatives and they denied the opportunity to lift 30,000 children out of poverty, an absolute disgrace conference. <laughs> the conference, that isn't something we're just seeing on a national level. The so-called city government in Glasgow, or as I like to call them, the Tribute Act, recently voted down Labour's budget proposals, which would have doubled the school clothing grant to £130, the highest clothing grant in Scotland. And they voted it down. That's the nationalist way. Talk left and vote right. 
conference, it should also not be accepted that the single biggest reason why young people in Scotland are declaring themselves homeless is because they've had a ne negative experience of telling their family that they're LGBT. Last week marked nearly 30 years since Margaret Thatcher stood at her party's conference and spoke about ending, and I quote, the inalienable right of young people to be gay. After she spoke those words, her government introduced a vicious piece of legislation that we all know as Section 28, a piece of legislation that the current Prime Minister supported. This meant that LGBT youth and support groups were forced to disband, and something that was a lifeline for so many young people just stopped because of a bitter party trying to impose their outdated views on society. Conference, the Conservative Party may claim to be different to the Tories of those 30 years ago, but not even half of Ruth Davidson's so-called progressive Conservative MPs could bring themselves to support inclusive education for LGBT young people and support the Thai Campaign Pledge. They say they've changed, but they remain the same nasty, bitter Tories that they've always been. Comrades, the Labour Party, in solidarity with trade unions, socialist societies and the cooperative movement, is the only force in these islands that exists to create an equal society where we are able to redistribute not, on, redistribute not only power, but wealth as well, to everyone, from the few to the many. We still have a long way to go, so let's get to work. Thank you. Right, we've got somebody at the side there, and yourself, and... Carol Malkin, Carrot Cumnock and Dune Valley Delegate. Can I quickly say that we are focusing on the child benefit top up, but that we fully support all the measures in the policy document to eradicate poverty. Conference, I am well known for coming to the rostrum and telling you about the beauty of Carrot Cumnock and Dune Valley. But today, conference, it doesn't seem so beautiful. My mood is one of sadness. Sadness as I live in an area where as many as a third of children live in poverty. So when I play with my own kids at the park, I look around and I know that many children may not have had breakfast, perhaps don't have a warm coat, or have never had a family trip out. Conference, I ask you, if there was one thing that you could do, what would it be? Now, I live in a house with an eight-year-old, so often the answer to that question goes along the lines of climb out the window with my spider web, or perhaps teleport ice cream to here, right now. And I love that. I love that my children are children and that they can dream. But conference, this is not the reality for many children in Scotland. It is a disgrace, a disgrace that a wealthy country like, so, like Scotland, so many children and family live in poverty. We know that poverty hurts. It damages childhoods, life chances, long-term health, Confidence it damages society. Now we know that under the Tories, poverty, including child poverty, will continue. Conservative welfare policies will push many children further into poverty. The lack of will to ensure fair pay or fair work practices means that even children from working families are being driven into debt and poverty. It is cruel and it is shocking. We must fight Theresa May and her Westminster policies, and we must fight Ruth Davidson and the Scottish Tories that support her. But conference, let me take you back to my original question. If you could do one thing, what would it be? And I would ask the Scottish Government to prioritise child poverty and take some action now. It is a frustration to me that I live in Scotland with a devolved parliament with significant powers, and yet the government, the SNP, the minister with powers, Jean Freeman, Carrick Cumnock and Dune Valley's MSP, seem reluctant to use their policies to, to end child poverty. Whilst I understand that topping up child benefit wouldn't solve poverty on its own, a top up of £5 per, chi per child would lift 30,000 children out of poverty. All of this, the third sector groups, backed by the trade unions, the faith groups and the children's commissioners agree. 
So what happens when you challenge the SNP on this? Standard response, can't be done, can't be done, I don't have the powers. They believe that if they say it long enough and often enough that we will believe them. However, if the debate does continue to persist, we move to the ever popular, well, it's somebody else's fault and that's why we can't do anything about it. I mean, why in a devolved parliament with the devolved powers would you make any different choices? And at the moment, I'm getting uh, very interested in the feedback from Jean Freeman and the SNP about the opposition to the top up. It would appear that well-versed ministers like Jean Freeman have suddenly realised that the universal approach reaches everyone. Well, it has been the case that universal policies uh, reach everyone for some time. Indeed, your flagship policies, from prescription charges to baby boxes, reach everyone, and I believe you argued it was worth it to reach the poorest. Conference, the reality is the SNP are making choices and they are choosing to do little. I have been asked many times why I'm an advocate of the top up and it's the time frame for me. Children living in poverty, the time is now. Child benefit top up is the quickest and most effective way to lift thousands of children out of poverty. I know we need long term solutions and I will fight for them. But children, thousands of children need real change now. So conference, if I asked you one last time, if you could do one thing what would it be? And I hope it would be to ask the SNP to eradicate child poverty with real change now for the many. Please support. John McKee, uh, Kelvin CLP. I'm a, a first time speaker to get an easy clap, if that's okay. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Um, politics is a matter of priorities. And what we want to look at is the priorities of the Labour Party in government on child poverty compared to the priorities of the SNP and Tory governments, which we have suffered all under for the last decade. Let's look at what they say. After a decade, after eight years in power, the Scottish National Party came out after eight years and say, we will set ambitious targets for 2030 to eradicate child poverty. Well, I remember the sort of targets that the SNP have met in their last eight years in power. Is anyone here in this hall Remember when they said there would be one teacher to 20 children per classroom? Do you, does everyone in this hall remember when they said they would close the attainment gap despite the fact it is even worse than in England for the very poorest children in our society? I remember that. I even remember they can't even get the target of one referendum in a generation. That's only, and that's only one. Like, the SNP, despite their bluster, are utterly milk toast. These are people who are attempting to put target for the middle classes to appear nice and presentable. What they want and what they say their priority is there is in detra is, is independence, ladies and gentlemen, not child poverty. Between 1997 and 2013, child poverty fell by 500,000 in this society. That's something that we should be proud of. And that's something we should never fail to remind the SNP that since 2015, child poverty has gone up by 40 and that is a disgrace, ladies and gentlemen. That is a disgrace conference, and we should never let them forget that. It is a matter of priorities, but not just the SNP, also the Conservative Party. Does anyone remember Ian Duncan Smith swanning round the east end of Glasgow like some pompous balloon, basically coming to tell, to tell the young East, the little east Enders how they can be better and work hard? I think it's time for the quiet man to turn down the volume, frankly, ladies and gentlemen. I think, does anyone see the text, the, the, the Twitter, uh, the tweet today, uh, just this week, by George Osborne saying we, we did it together, by David Cameron saying it was the right thing to do. Never have I seen such a hollow, empty, empty thing to say. What we have seen 
It's not that we are in it together. If we are in it together, how do, how, why, don't, why doesn't George Osborne David Cameron tell it to the disabled, ladies and gentlemen, who have, who have about 85% uh, according to the appeals, found that they are not fit to work. Why don't they tell it to the disabled who, who the suicide rates have doubled? Why don't they tell it to the child, children yet to be born who by 2030, according to the IFS report, are expected to be in poverty as by an increase of 50%? Ladies and gentlemen, what we provide is real hope in Labour Party, real solutions, a, a winter truce, but a winter truce which, which Richard Leonard called for, and which I wrote a column today in the Herald, which I suggest you check out. Um, what I also say that what we offer is, human, is basic human decency, ladies and gentlemen. We say that it's time for change. We think it's time for real change. Politics is a matter of priorities. We say that real change isn't just like last time where 500,000 children were brought out of poverty. We want to bring out all one million children out of poverty in Scotland. That is ambition. That is real change. That is the only target which we should set and we should not let Nicola Sturgeon forget it until she has achieved it or we have thrown them out, cast that useless government out and we have done it ourselves. I am proud to back this motion conference. Sorry, I'm going to disappear behind this lectern, I think. Yep. I'll have to stand and do that. Morning conference, Heather Pugh, Edinburgh Northern Elite. ask you to support this motion. Um, I live in an area that's very disparate. At one end of our, our uh, CLP, there are people who are living in half million to quarter million pound houses. At the other end, there's people like you and I. We have uh, two food banks serving our area. One's the Trussell Trust, and you don't want to hear what I think about them. And the other one is in a church. And every week, they give out food to just under, a handful of under 6,000 families. Um, there are, you'll have probably seen in the news at some point in the last six months, about a whole load of young families, young mothers and their children being um, evicted because of the changes to welfare cuts. And they, some of them are still looking for houses. They were put into B&B accommodation. They uh, aren't, weren't able to cook for their children. They couldn't afford it. They didn't have the facilities. They weren't able to get the children across the city to the schools that they go to because the B&B was well away from their normal areas where they lived. Um, they're away from their families and their support units as well. The actual ward that I live in has got the highest in-work poverty uh, rate in, in Edinburgh and in big parts of Scotland. It's also got the, the highest child poverty rate uh, for Edinburgh and for large parts of Scotland. The people that are lucky enough to work at that end of the ward are all in zero hours contracts. Um, there are very few people with proper permanent jobs and they, you can see hope die in the eyes of the children as they're leaving school because they know that they're likely not going to get a job either. So poverty to me is a real sort of bind on the working class families of Edinburgh. Um, the Labour Party really needs to get behind this and we need Labour in Scotland to make a difference to these families. Thank you, conference. Thank you. Morning, conference. Um, Kevin McGregor, Kilmarnock and Urban Valley CLP, Cooperative Party and Unison member, um, first time delegate and speaker as well. Thanks. Um, comrades, in Kilmarnock and Loudoun, child poverty has recently been reported at a level of over 25% uh, according to the Campaign to End Child Poverty. And this shameful figure appears to be reflective of the horrific levels of child poverty across Scotland. With a government in Holyrood who demand more powers in the name of making Scotland a more progressive, fairer place and then fail to use those powers when they have them, and a government in Westminster hell-bent on creating more austerity, more cuts and more misery for ordinary families. 
it is only the Scottish Labour Party that is willing to put forward plans to end this scourge of child poverty and to use this powers the Scottish Government has available to it. It is a disgrace that the Minister for Social Security, Jean Freeman, SNP, who is part of our local authority, East Ayrshire, and her constituency, as my comrades in Carrick, Cumnock and Moonvalley, CLP, know all too well, um, she has so glibly dismissed our proposals for action, dismissed the excellent work done by the Child Poverty Action Group, uh, the Give Me Five campaign, the trade unions and other organisations, um, not to mention the concerns of our very own constituents in South and East Ayrshire. Um, it's time for real change, which is only possible with the Scottish Labour Party and our progressive policies for the many. And comrades, quite briefly, I just urge you to support the motion. Thank you very much. speakers there and apologies to those I wasn't able, able to call due, due, due to time. I'm just going to ask Rhoda Grant, MSP, Parliamentary Business Manager and Women and Equality Spokesperson to close the debate. While she's just going to, to the lectern, can I just say a wee personal observation here? I remember many, many, many years ago in my house in Inverness um, when we had informal meetings of what would now be called Young Labour we weren't really allowed to call it young labour at the time then because there wasn't such a thing because it was the old older men that were in charge of the party they were doing a brilliant job but um, that, that was the, the way it was 30 odd years later I am really proud to be in a platform with two of these members of that unofficial young labour team at the moment Rhoda and Elaine lovely to have you here well done ladies Thank you, Linda, and those days don't seem that far away, but when you put years on it, you put years on me as well. <laughs> um, good morning, conference. We all know that tackling poverty and inequality is not something that we debate for an hour and then move on. It's something that runs through the whole of our conference. It's what unites us and drives us. In every area, our ambition is to create an equal society where everyone reaches their full potential, where everyone is part of that society and where everyone contributes and benefits together. It's, it's therefore apt that we start this debate reminding us why we're here and what we can achieve together. This year we celebrated 100 years of votes for women and I wonder what our sisters who fought for the right to vote would think about how far we've come. I recently learned that, a that women from St Kilda registered to vote at that very first election. And they couldn't vote on St Kilda. They had to travel to Harris. And I, we take voting so much for granted. I wonder how many people today would make that journey to vote. I believe that these women would be disappointed that we're still fighting for equality, not just for women, but for the whole of society. Yesterday, we celebrated International Women's Day and the theme this year was Press for Progress. We have made progress, but there is still a long way to go for true equality. Here and Mark talked about Mary Barber and how apt was it that her statue was unveiled on International Women's Day. The Asdol motion talks about ending child poverty. It promotes steps to combat child poverty, but also to combat the impact of child poverty. We know that a child's life chances are directly affected by their mother's wealth and education. Therefore, if women were equal, the whole of society prospers. Karen pointed out that this generation will be worse off than their parents and their grandparents, and that's just so wrong. I'm proud that North Lanarkshire Council and their Food 365 initiative is, is, is working and will help children in poverty, but I'm also really sad that this is required in our wealthy country today. The Glasgow CLP motion rightly points out the financial barrier faced by those seeking bankruptcy. People who have nothing are still expected to find significant amounts of money to access the remedy. And Jessica and John told us that even people on benefits needed to find the money to access bankruptcy. I think that is a disgrace. We will debate health inequalities this weekend as well, and we'll look at life expectancy of people from different parts of the country. And it's really sad 
that your place of birth puts your health and life chances into a postcode lottery. Health inequalities are the outcomes of an unequal society, not the cause. Our vision is that every child must have a chance, the same prospects and the ability to make change. Imagine if the child who could find a cure for cancer or who would bring about world peace was born into poverty. Their education suffers, their chance to reach their potential is lost, and they're likely to die many years earlier. In these conditions, they won't find that cure or secure that peace. And it's not only those people that lose out, we all do. Therefore, conference, together, we can really create an equal society. Let's make that our priority this weekend.